Hey, everyone. Welcome back to The Jacobin Show. I'm Jen Pan, and I'm here today with Ariella Thornhill. Ariella, hey, what's good? It's good to see you again. Yeah, we, we both missed- had weeks off. We both had weeks off. Um, Luckily, we are actually kind of coincidentally reuniting to sort of pick up where we left Mm -hmm. off with Jennifer Silva. So, um, you know, tonight's theme is why Americans hate the government. And I just want to quickly mention that we will have Matt Brunig, who is the founder and president of the People's Policy Project, coming on in about 30 minutes to talk to us about uh, building an actually functioning welfare state. Um, That maybe people won't hate. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess that's kind of the question that I like wanted to kick off with. So there's this conception, I think, that um, that Americans are like uniquely libertarian or like uniquely freedom loving. And that's why we don't have a strong welfare state. Right. Because Americans just hate the government too much. Um, And there's kind of a correlate, which is that Americans are too racist for a welfare state. Uh, But that's another can of worms. And I don't know if we'll have time to open that one. Yeah, that's (laughs) Um, another episode. Yeah. Um, But on the subject of, you know, Americans hating the government and being too libertarian, and that's why we don't have a welfare state, I actually think that mixes up cause and effect. I think, you know, I think part of the reason why Americans hate the government, and Americans do hate the government, uh, there's very low public trust in the government in the U.S. Uh, Politicians and Congress people are like some of the most hated figures in American life. Uh, So there's definitely a real animosity toward the government. But I actually think that it doesn't originate with the population. It starts from the fact that the government wants to dismantle itself, right? Mm -hmm. So if you think back to the 1980s, Reagan in, you know, his 1981 inauguration speech, he has the very famous line where he says something like, government is not the solution, government is the problem. And when your own government is saying that, like, who, who would like that? Yeah, and we saw this with um, the crisis in Texas after a unbelievably devastating storm. Um, Kale, can you pull up this tweet by former governor uh, Tim Boyd of Colorado City, Texas? He essentially blamed individuals for not being able to provide their own water and power, saying this is sadly the product of a socialist government where they feed people (laughs) to believe that few will work and others will become dependent for handouts. Now handouts has extended to water and electricity, things in a public grid, municipal services. It's unbelievable. But what's worse is that you can gain traction in the government by being anti-government. And I quote, yeah. That quote is like really amazing, like because I'm struggling to figure out how even the most dedicated anti-state libertarian is supposed to generate their own electricity. I know exactly how to do it. You watch <laughs> old Looney Tunes cartoons, you get a bike, you plug the wires into the walls, and you just pedal as fast as you can. Clean yeah, I was also just get right, a right. Just I was dig. also thinking about that like elementary school project where you plug wires into oh, a yeah. potato yeah. and like a so light bulb lights up. Yeah, yeah. No, it's unbelievable. And it's it's really distressing that this kind of anti-government um, sentiment is so bread and butter for government officials. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think because another it validates the mistrust. And it says the only way to change this is to have people in power who further mistrust the state. Mm-hmm. And obviously that hasn't worked at all. Yeah, I think another kind of disturbing element, at least for me, with the fallout from Texas is that Um, So, of course, you had, you know, Republican sort of commentators and figureheads being like, well, like everybody should fend for themselves. Like this isn't time for government to step in when it obviously is. And then also like this weird there was that weird climate angle where it was like the windmills did this. um, But, you know, that wasn't true. Um, But then you also had a weird liberal backlash where you have people like uh, the author Stephen King uh, saying basically, you know, like, this, hey, Texas, keep voting for officials who don't believe in climate change and supported privatization of the power grid. Maybe in four years you can vote for Trump again. He believes in the latter, but not the former. Perfect. Um, which I think is, uh, I mean, you know, uh, David Griscom and I sort of talked about this sentiment when he was on last time um, and mm-hmm. how there's this kind of smug attitude from, you know, blue state America, if, if you will, that um, residents of so-called red states are responsible for for this misfortune somehow, which mm-hmm. is completely ugly and also completely untrue. Well, and it's a, this um, false idea that people are voting 
um, against their own interests, right? Exactly. And so it creates this kind of victim blame or like certain people are worth government services because they ostensibly support the right politicians and other people aren't. And that is so unbelievably cruel and wrongheaded. I don't think people are thinking it through as a mm -hmm. notion. Mm -hmm. um, I did watch you and, and when David filled in, which was a great show and I remember him talking about people saying, oh, well, you know, blue states pay most of the taxes. We should split off from the red states and create our own blue state utopia. I don't think people think through the kind of uh, traditional social contract that would, was articulated through the nation state, mm -hmm. particularly because it's degraded for so many people. Mm -hmm. So it does come down to this idea of like, I got mine because I did X, Y, or Z the right way. Maybe it's voting, maybe it's getting the right kind of job, maybe it's being the right kind of responsible or being the right, you know, having the right value. And if you don't get yours, it's because you've done it wrong. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, Jennifer Silva's book illustrates that so well, mm -hmm. because not only is there a crisis of um, security for so many of the people in it, they navigate it through, I, uh, a kind of narrative of per personal hardship. And then in a broad political way, the haves and the have nots are explained mm -hmm. the, the same exact way by government officials. Mm -hmm. So it's not a departure. It's not like, oh, only poor and working class people have this ideology. It's a hegemonic ideology. Yeah. And I think uh, we explore that. I, I know your segment does and mine does. Yeah. On. Um, I, I just want to follow up on that really quickly by mentioning that, you know, something like almost 100 percent of people in the U.S. will rely or have relied on some government benefit at some point in their lives. Right. So, you know, the obvious ones are like welfare, um, food stamps, Social Security, but things like um, tax credits or tax benefits mm -hmm. or like, uh, you know, mortgage, uh, a home mortgage interest deduction. Mm -hmm. Those are also government benefits. And those are yep. things that aren't necessarily like quite so obvious. Um, but the point being that like everybody does rely on the government, yet at the same time, there is this uh, longstanding animosity toward it. And um, I want to bring up this one picture, um, which is a guy holding a sign that says, keep government out of my Medicare. Um, and I don't know if you remember, but like during the Tea Party years, um, pictures like this would circulate around a lot because I think that they would pop up at like Tea Party rallies and stuff. Like Tea Party, mm -hmm. obviously very like anti-state, anti-government movement. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of liberals shared this image to be like, oh, like look at how stupid these people are or whatever. And like, I mean, I don't know that guy, like maybe he's stupid. Like I'm sure, I'm sure like some of the like Tea Party people were like, you know, <laughs> like had their issues or whatever. Yeah. Um, but I also think that the like, I don't know that guy, but I do think that the sign gets at something interesting, which is, again, like, I I think that there is something deeply wrong with our government if, if it is providing these, like, sort of half-baked and broken services and people don't even really realize it, you know, or, yeah. like, hate the government anyway. Yeah. So it's or like... like a government service and don't realize that it's a government service. It's exactly. like, there was a clip going around. I don't know how to find this, where to begin to find this, but there was a man who was like a uh, guest on Fox News and he's like, I was on Medicaid. I was on welfare. Nobody helped me. <laughs> right. And right. right. It's like, maybe we can laugh at the cognitive dissonance there, but we should actually think about why are those programs in his mind, not government programs. Mm -hmm, they functioned mm -hmm. really well for him. Why does he not see them as like the kind of handout that he was on the show right. to speak against? Right, right. Yeah, and um, again, like I said, I think, again, like to me, I think that's something that is a problem with the government, not necessarily just those people. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. So, okay, so on that note, um, let's dive into our segments. Um, I think what I wanna talk about is um, basically our self-hating government, basically what we've been talking about already. So, uh, you know, as we all know, Republican politicians and of course, many of their Democratic colleagues are trying to dismantle the social safety net at pretty much any given time. So you'll typically see this in the form of tax breaks for the wealthy, rampant privatization of goods and services, and endless budget cuts that starve schools and public programs of funding. However, another way that policymakers famously and deliberately undermine government aid is through excessive red tape. 
So this is what the policy scholars Pamela Hurd and Donald Moynihan call administrative burdens. And an administrative burden is basically anything that makes a service harder for people to access or um, any kind of hoop that people have to jump through before they can get benefits. So for example, if you need food stamps, but you have to fill out tons of forms about your income and whether you receive child support uh, before you can qualify, that's an administrative burden. Likewise, if you are trying to apply for unemployment insurance and you have to go through a half-broken website that uh, keeps crashing and looks like it was made in GeoCities in 1992, and then you have to spend hours on the phone on hold before you can talk to a person, that's also an administrative burden. And I think what's important to know about um, these types of, you know, excessive red tape measures is that it's not just that the government is like shitty at making websites or, you know, they're incredibly inefficient or they don't know how to run programs. Rather, what's going on is that making people jump through tons of hoops for benefits is actually another way for lawmakers to deliberately undermine public programs. So I want to look at one example in particular, um, because this has been in the news again. Uh, earlier this week, the Biden administration asked the Supreme Court to toss out an upcoming case regarding Medicaid work requirements. So to understand this case, we have to back to 2018, um, which is when Arkansas became the first state to institute work requirements for Medicaid recipients. So what that meant is in order to remain eligible for benefits, people on Medicaid in Arkansas had to submit paperwork proving that they were working or in job training or volunteering for at least 20 hours a week, or they had to file for an exemption showing that they were disabled. So, you know, unsurprisingly, the rollout of this new requirement was a complete disaster for Medicaid recipients. Um, many beneficiaries were just not notified about the new paperwork that they were supposed to file. Um, others were trapped in this insane nightmare of trying to comply with an incredibly confusing and poorly functioning system. So let's take a look at this clip from PBS. Adrian McGonigal's life is coming undone. You never want me to stay longer, but... In the past few weeks, he's lost his job, his health insurance, even his feelings of self-worth. Without my medication, I can't really sleep good, so... He's worked all his life, but now, at the age of 40, he's entirely dependent on people like his mom to get by. And he blames the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Your status as far as... The Arkansas Works is concerned. This summer, he had a decent-paying job at a chicken plant outside Bentonville. But when the Trump administration allowed the state of Arkansas to impose new work requirements on Medicaid, he, like many Medicaid recipients, got confused about how to report his hours. I thought that everything was good about this. I thought it was just a one-time deal that you reported and then that was it. He was wrong. He was supposed to log those hours online every month. He became one of the 12,000 people that the state has booted from the Medicaid rolls in the last three months. How do I get my insurance back on? He discovered this only when he went to fill prescriptions at this drugstore, and the pharmacist told him, sorry, your coverage has been canceled. And that it was going to be like $340 for one of the medications and like $80 for the other one. So he left empty-handed. This was a big deal because McGonagall has severe COPD, a chronic lung disease that makes it difficult to breathe. Without his meds, he landed in the hospital multiple times and missed a lot of work. His supervisor tried to accommodate him, but he wasn't healthy enough to perform his job, so he lost it. He's now part of a lawsuit against the federal government, charging that his story is a cautionary tale. His lawyers say it proves why adding work requirements to a health insurance program can backfire and actually make it harder for the poor to hold down a job. So unfortunately, Adrian was not the only one who experienced dire consequences. As a result of these incredibly burdensome and punitive work requirements, more than 18,000 people in Arkansas lost their Medicaid coverage in 2018. Now, of the Arkansas residents who lost Medicaid, 50% reported serious problems paying off medical debt, 56% delayed medical care because of the cost, and 64% delayed taking medications because of the cost. So, you know, in addition to this hardship on Arkansas residents, 
We also now have several studies on the implementation of the work, the work requirements that have basically proven that they produced no significant increases in employment in the state of Arkansas. So does that mean that this initiative was a failure? Actually, quite the opposite, uh, because the work requirements were never really supposed to increase employment or really even reduce Medicaid fraud. This was simply a way to kick people off of Medicaid with the ultimate goal of shrinking the program. So to go back a little bit, um, at the beginning of 2018, when Arkansas's state legislature was debating whether or not to reauthorize, to reauthorize the state's Medicaid expansion under the Affordable Care Act, uh, Republican lawmakers forced the addition of work requirements in exchange for their support of the reauthorization. This is what one state senator had to say about the addition of work requirements to Medicaid. It certainly makes it more palatable, said Republican Senator Alan Clark, an opponent of the expansion who said he was undecided on whether to support the budget measure. Still, overall, I'm not a fan of the program. So, you know, what, what we really see here is that when politicians want to gut a program, but they know they could face political repercussions for doing so, sometimes it's just easier for them to strangle the program in red tape, right? Um, and, and I do want to mention here that in 2019, a federal court did put a hold on Arkansas's Medicaid work requirement, um, which is why the case is now before the Supreme Court. And hopefully the Biden administration um, will be successful in getting it tossed out, which will mean that Medicaid in Arkansas will remain free of work requirements. Um, but of course, this will not undo the significant hardship that Arkansas Medicaid recipients experienced in 2018. And just to, you know, really drive home the fact that instituting excessive administrative burdens is a deliberate policy choice that's meant to undermine public services, um, I now want to look at a different example that shows that um, when the government wants to do this, it can actually shift the burden onto itself and away from its citizens. So... There's one public program in the US that almost everybody will use, almost everybody likes this program, and um, at this point, most politicians are afraid to openly attack it. That's of course social security, uh, and one reason why this program is so durable is because during the New Deal, policymakers explicitly designed the program to minimize administrative burdens and red tape. So, you know, the Social Security Administration famously keeps track of your earnings for you. They automatically calculate your benefits um, and your eligibility. And basically, as soon as you turn 67 and it's time to start collecting your benefits, um, all you have to do is enroll on the SSA website or show up at a local field office. I think there's something like 1,500 in the U.S. And we can definitely, you know, improve Social Security even more. But overall, it's been a huge success. Um, today, the poverty rate among the elderly is around 9%. There are some estimates that without Social Security, close to half of all seniors would be living in poverty. And of course, it's not just the US. We can also look at how other countries have minimized administrative burdens or have found a way to put the onus back onto the state. So for example, Taiwan, um, in the 1990s, they uh, uh, transitioned to a single payer healthcare system. And what they did to roll it out was they sent out teams of social workers to rural and underserved areas in order to just register everybody they could find for the new system and explain its benefits. Um, as a result, today, close to 100% of the Taiwanese population has health coverage. Uh, the public satisfaction with the healthcare system is consistently over 80%. And at the same time, uh, Taiwan's healthcare administration costs are actually some of the lowest in the world. So I want to just end by saying, you know, this is what government is capable of. And this is why I kind of take issue with some of the libertarian and or anarchist arguments that a Byzantine bureaucracy is just something that's inherent to a state run program. Um, I, I don't think anybody defends how awful it is to try to make people navigate systems that are, you know, designed to block them out. But the point, again, is that we have to think of the barriers in these systems as policy choices in and of themselves. So I will wrap up there and turn it over to you, Ariella, if you have thoughts. Yeah, I mean, you can look at Taiwan's success with COVID as okay. proof of the way that their single payer system has worked. They have had uh, 942 COVID cases and nine deaths 
um, during the pandemic. And that is absolutely down to the ease and accessibility of healthcare through the single payer option. Yeah, it's um, it's actually very interesting how COVID has just exposed every contradiction that we've been talking about so far. Um, again, with COVID, you know, lots of people were trying to navigate unemployment and mm -hmm. uh, couldn't. I mean, because every state's you know requirements and system are different. Like people experienced, you know, websites that were down for hours, couldn't get through on the phone. Um, I don't know mm -hmm. if you saw that there's a Reddit forum just dedicated to navigating unemployment that has basically exploded in popularity during this time because there's just nowhere else that people can turn. Yeah. Um, so again, uh, it, it is a kind of interesting uh, test case, I guess, a really horrible one um, that just shows the state that our government is in. But also mm -hmm. like you were saying, what other people or what other countries are doing that shows that like it can be done. Yeah, exactly. And you know, the administrative burden um, shift is not unique just to government policies, right. right? This is what insurance companies do. This is what happens when you have to return your router <laughs> and they're like, no, you have to go to Governor's Island or something at 13 o'clock on a Saturday. <laughs> you know, a lot of firms use these because they, don't want to be seen as not offering a service or making something difficult. And so they shift that onto the individual and they say, oh no, you just failed to understand 35 pages of legalese right. to access your insurance benefit. Right. Wait, the modem thing is really funny because I didn't even think of that, but it's totally true. I've had to do that. <laughs> I think I still have a modem <laughs> right. to return and I'm You're still getting charged. charged for it. Yeah. Yes, and I can't figure out how to get it back. And it's not, this is like, not an accident. There are a lot of people whose job it is to force you into these little lab rat scenarios mm -hmm. where you can never pick the right direction mm -hmm. and never figure out your way out. Right. It's the same when you read credit card small print. Oh yeah. Or you know any so many transactions in the U.S., including getting prescription drugs, have these kinds of things baked into them, and then the risk or the liability shifts onto the consumer. You can't sue your credit card company. Right. Um, or it's very very difficult to actually hold these institutions accountable because they wrap themselves up in these kinds of burdens right, for exactly. consumers. Yeah, that leads me to my my segment, which is about the kind of private welfare states that exist in America. So uh, Jen's uh, example of what happened in Arkansas is really typical of the way that welfare in the United States has been under attack. And this has been happening for years. And as she rightly pointed out, this is because politicians don't want to be seen as actively fighting against these kinds of policies. And so creating these burdens are a way of undermining that while maintaining your you know, innocence or the perception that maybe you in part support them or you're on the fence and you're considering all sides. Um, but in the US, a lot of people beyond the poor and working class rely on benefits that are granted by employers and that too is being degraded or outright dissolved. Here's Jacob Hacker, political scientist and author of the book, The Great Risk Shift. The United States is unique in the degree to which workers get their benefits through their job. In no other country did workers come to rely so much on their employers for their basic security. In fact, employers were like mini welfare states, right? Providing the kind of benefits that in other countries were provided by the public sector. So over the last generation, there's been this massive shift of economic risk from the broad shoulders of government and corporations onto the fragile backs of American families. And the, the result is that Americans are more and more worried about the American dream, about the idea that if you work hard, you'll be able to get ahead. It's not that the U.S. doesn't spend on benefits. If you combine public benefit systems with these mini welfare employee, employer funded benefit systems, we spend as much as other rich nations like Sweden on a similar package of benefits, but with very, very different results. The degradation of these mini welfare states is what Jacob Hacker has termed the great risk shift. Rather than companies or the state shouldering the burden of risk, risk has been privatized with individuals and families having to personally manage and mitigate economic crises with no safety net. And every American is familiar with the disastrous results. 
Under the ACA, most employers have to provide or contribute some kind of health care plan to their employees, particularly full-time employees. But individuals have to figure out how to pay huge premiums, out-of-pocket fees, and continue to work while weathering health crises. This includes reading, as I said to Jen, 35 pages of legalese to figure out if your insurance plan has a deductible, what's covered, what co-insurance is, what co-pays you have to pay. Rather than the state providing all people health care, regardless of employment status, individuals are forced to work in order to have access to expensive and often inadequate care. Here's how Erica Griffiths managed four-stage breast cancer while continuing to work. I tried to be as flexible as possible and, and you know, I'd work from the couch, laying down sometimes and conference calls. And when we first uh, started chemo, it, it was all a whirlwind and happened very quickly. Um, and I had talked to a bunch of different friends and friends of friends and just trying to get an idea of what to expect for chemo. And um, someone had told me based on the drugs that I was getting that after, you know, like the day of chemo, I would feel fine. Um, the next day I might feel a little bit tired and then maybe like by the third day is when I would really start to, to feel the effects. So I kind of strategically was thinking, how can I do this where it wouldn't affect my job? So I uh, decided on Thursday and basically it was exactly that. Thursday I go to chemo, I'm there all day, I work and then Friday, maybe like Friday night, I would start to get a little bit tired and then Saturday was hell. Like thousands of others, Erica worried about losing her job and benefits that were the difference between life and death. And she's not alone. One oncologist who has interviewed about that story said that 50% of the patients in her clinic continued to work while being treated for breast cancer with chemotherapy. The healthcare risk shift is responsible for millions of stories of personal suffering and loss. And more Americans are delaying care because of cost. As you can see in this graphic, over the last three years, the percentage of Americans putting off treatment for serious conditions has climbed to 25%, whereas in 2015, it was 19%. We've seen a s slightly more modest increase in the amount of people who put off treatment for any condition, going from around 31% in 2015 to 33%. But we've seen that since 2001, that rate has risen for all Americans. And this is no surprise that it's much worse for Americans with lower incomes. Let's look at this graph that shows people delaying serious medical care because of cost by household income. And you can see that more people who earn less than $40,000 a year are putting off those costs. And that skyrocketed between 2017 and 2019. But it's the case that almost every earning bracket has seen these trends. Another critical side of the healthcare risk shift is that workers are encouraged to open health savings account, HSAs, or flexible spending accounts for healthcare and dependent care. These accounts are used to pay for qualifying healthcare or dependent care expenses. They use money from employees' paychecks to pay for this care. This benefit is supposed to be twofold. You have money saved for health expenses and the money is untaxed. However, if you have an FSA, not all the money you put in rolls over to the next year. So there's a risk here of an employee saving for health care expenses and losing the money if they don't spend it on qualified purchases. Also, lower earners may not have the option to save money for these expenses, particularly with two thirds of Americans living paycheck to paycheck. This also means employers will expect employees to make do with worse plans because they can use the HSA or, H or FSA to pay for increased expenses. And these kinds of programs are extremely popular with Republicans and Democrats, but Republicans have been championing to expand the uh, remit of these programs so that they cover more things like ACH premiums um, on the Obamacare market. It's no wonder that medical expenses cause around 530,000 people to file for bankruptcy each year, according to one study. This was cited on um, CNBC, but it's also been used by Bernie Sanders to talk about the imperative need for universal coverage. 
because these medical expenses are wiping out the wealth and security of half a million families a year. Another key area of risk shift is retirement funds, as Jacob Hacker explains further in this video. Most Americans had a defined benefit pension plan at their place of work. If they had a pension plan, it was one that guaranteed them a secure retirement income. Well, most of you probably don't even know what a defined benefit plan is. You've heard about 401ks and these other plans that are just like investment accounts that are run by your employer. Well, it used to be that you could get a plan that looked like Social Security, but it came from your employer. And that's no longer there. So more of the risk of retirement planning, more of the responsibility is on you. So let's look at some of the data about retirement benefits in the U.S. Um, this graph shows that roughly twice as many families have defined contribution plans versus defined benefit pensions. That's the difference between the 401k and a pension that guarantees you a certain amount of money rather than being subject to stock market fluctuations. But participation in pensions is more equal ac across education, race, and income groups. And you can see that on the graph. While participation in 401ks is extremely unequal in these groups, there's also a high share of, of high school graduates with pensions compared to the share of college graduates, 21% versus 24%. And the share of black people with pensions, 20% is almost as high as the share of white people with the similar plans. However, the participation gap for single women is wider for pensions than for defined contribution plans. What this means is essentially you can see the risk of retirement depending on which demographic you fall into, depending on your qualifications. With pension plans, it's more even across the board, but fewer employees have access to that kind of guaranteed benefit plan because they are not union employees and private employers are switching um, largely to 401ks, particularly after the 1980s. Unions were a bulwark against the retirement risk shift, but with a weak labor movement in the US, more firms have turned to 401ks, which further drives inequality. We can see in the next graph that Despite rules intended to ensure that high-income families don't disproportionately benefit from the tax subsidies for retirement savings, savings-based retirement systems do not simply reflect, they also magnify inequality. The bottom 60% of working-age families receives 17% of total income, but holds 7% of retirement account balances. Meanwhile, the top 20% receives 63% of income, but holds 74% of retirement account balances. So the gap between the 1% and the 99%, the gap between the 80% and the 20% is even bigger when you look at retirement benefits. And that means that people as they age become more and more susceptible to other types of risk and economic shock, uh, shocks. We see this time and again, jobs are less secure, even in higher paying positions. Hours are not guaranteed, benefits are weak, childcare is unaffordable, and two earners can barely scrape by. Mortgages have been acting as piggy banks for families, but the value of houses can swing wildly with very little protection for owners, as we saw with the Great Recession. Americans live with an incredible amount of insecurity and volatility, even those who are middle class or upper middle class. In this graphic, we can see the likelihood of having uh, of a person having spent a year in poverty, on assistance, or unemployed. And we can see this gets higher as the person gets older, almost approaching 80%, an 80% chance by age 60. And privatizing risk explains a lot of this precarity and volatility within the lifespan of a person in America. In the second graph, uh, that I've pulled up, I'm sorry, I'm, it's a very graph-heavy segment, we can see that people are also likely to spend time in the top 20% of earners. You can see that the share of people who spend, oh, this is the wrong graph. This is a poverty graph again. 
<laughs> there is another graph that I should have sent Kale that shows that people have a high chance, almost 70% chance of spending time in the top 20% of earners, but they don't stay there. That class position is not fixed for people in America and the risk and precarity they feel is felt across the board. So just as we see risk in terms of people entering into poverty, even when you enter into what should be a relatively economically stable position in the economy, you are not protected and it's not certain in any way whatsoever. There is very little in place to protect Americans from economic shocks, which can come from all manner of situations. There's also very little in place to make sure they can recover from those shocks. So people fend for themselves with piecemeal individual situations like we'll see in this next video. Aaron, his wife Celia, and their two children have lived in this parking lot outside of Seattle for the past nine months. When he has a day off, he will be in the front seat. And then the guinea pigs are at our feet. These guinea pigs are therapy for their son Daniel, who is autistic and traumatized by the family's situation. Before we got the guinea pigs, he was not very verbal. He didn't speak a lot. It was very hard on Daniel. He and I were out here, and um, he said, I hate this life, and I hate you. They asked us daily, when will we get a house? When will we get an apartment? Uh, how long are we going to stay here? And all we said, we, we don't know. We are trying our best, because we are trying our best. But their best never seems to be good enough, in part because Aaron makes $17 an hour, often too much money to qualify for public housing assistance. I reached a point where I really didn't see any hope for our situation. That sense of hopelessness led Aaron to contemplate suicide as a way to give his family a better life. I looked up um, what my likely um, social security death benefits for my children would be. Celia and the kids were asleep and I tried to hang myself. And um, the belt didn't hold. Um, that video is just heart-wrenching. This is a man who works at the post office and commutes two hours a day by scooter and bus because he can't, but he can't support his family on his income or qualify for benefits when he earns $17 an hour. So his family is homeless, taking care of an autistic child who is obviously traumatized as any child would be living in these circumstances. One thing that is a key takeaway from this video is that he contemplated suicide so that his kids could receive social security benefits. And as Jen said, Social Security is a popular universal program that almost every American will use during their life. It's one that guarantees benefits and one that the government administrates so it's easy to receive them. This is an example of a program where the government shares the risk so individuals can retire or so that their families can have income after their death. This became the only thing he could rely on to help support his family after being turned away from welfare benefits, after living in a country where a working person could not support their family on a single income. We need to take all of these benefits away from employers. In past shows, we've talked about why employers who constantly degrade these benefits don't want to have social insurance programs that are guaranteed and universal. Maybe it would be cheaper for employers not to have to provide health care benefits or pay into unemployment insurance. Maybe it would be cheaper for them to pay for these things through taxes that pool risk in a single system. But they're not going to give up that power over working people's lives. As Jacob Hacker shows in The Great Risk Shift, this precarity affects every American regardless of class and regardless of income. Only social programs that pool risk and guarantee benefits can turn the tide and lower how far people can fall. Oh, Jen, you're muted.
Sorry, guys, I do this every time. Um, I, I, I was just saying, I think that risk shift is a really compelling uh, way of thinking about this issue. Um, and I think you can see during the coronavirus, you can see it playing out in real time in a very mm -hmm. compressed way, right? So in the beginning, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, the federal government was basically like completely absent, as were a lot of state governments. And you could sort of see risk being shifted to employers, right? So it mm -hmm. was like employers, like, should you close? Should you furlough or like, lay off your employees like it's up to you and then yeah slowly and they subsidized um people's livelihoods and well-being through employment mm -hmm. again because so many things are channeled through that so the ppp loans were a way of making sure companies could continue to pay workers mm -hmm. and kind of um weather the storm but you had to have a job right and even that. And I think, you know, even before like the shutdown started being mandated, it was kind of like, oh, like employ like bars and restaurants. What do you think? Like, yeah, gyms, like, yeah. So, you know, there was a lot that was left in the hands of the employers. Um, and then you could see the risk being shifted to the general population where suddenly the rhetoric was like, everybody needs to wear a mask. Oh, mm -hmm. did you go to a party? Like, did you see your yeah. grandma? Like you're like you're doing this. Um, mm -hmm. And the whole time, you know, uh, uh, I, I I remember Bernie Sanders had pointed out like, hey, we should use like the government should be manufacturing masks and sending them to people for yeah. free. Like that's an example of the government taking yeah. the burden. The CDC of shouldn't it. put up a guide that says you can make a mask out of a coffee filter right. in an old sweatshirt. Right. Which is what they did. Right. You know, it really you see this over and over again, too, where it's up to the people who are part of these failing systems. It's There's retrenchment on the government side, but there's something similar with the way that employers were meant to provide yeah. these benefits, mm -hmm. where they're pulling back, they're, they're making employees just be part-time to deny them benefits, they're using gig work, right? More and more ways of forcing precarity onto people mm -hmm. who are working multiple jobs, have multiple earners per household. And with the pandemic, you know, some of the, the CARES Act targeted exactly this shift that Jacob, Jacob Hacker talks about. You could withdraw money from your 401k and it wouldn't be taxed. And that was a way to try to get people to balance the risk for themselves mm -hmm. by withdrawing from their own retirement funds. Right. Right. Or rather than the government paying people's rent during the pandemic, you can take on debt. You're free to take on you know, thousands of dollars in debt, you can't be evicted. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the mor moratorium ends and what you have, you know, right, you owe like debt. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And there are people who are, you know, high earners who have mm -hmm. so much debt that they have negative wealth. Mm -hmm. You see this over and over again. You see this with the narratives about, you know, Trump supporters, you know, many of whom are small business owners, they're not as down and out as they seem to be. But the way that they're responding to general precarity in the United States is the way that everybody is responding to it, right? They're saying, this has to be in my individual control. I can't rely on anybody else. We even see this with the way like pharmaceutical drugs are marketed in the US where it's like, ask your doctor about such and such. And right. then th two seconds later, there's a lawsuit about it. Mm -hmm. So you are left to mitigate the risks of what you consume for your own health as an individual, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. you can't necessarily rely on uh, a job to provide you benefits if you get a chronic illness from taking a prescription drug that you saw for restless leg syndrome or something. Right, right. exactly. <laughs> yeah. And so it's this cycle that you kind of see at every single level um, even with childcare or with schools, open a savings account for your child mm -hmm. so they can go mm -hmm. to college, open a FSA, which also covers dependent care. So you can open one of these employee funded um, savings accounts to cover daycare costs. Mm -hmm. But if you don't use it, sorry. Right. The firm right. that brokered it keeps that money. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I think on that note, uh, we want to bring out Matt Brunig, who is a champion of the welfare state and shifting <laughs> risk back to the welfare state. Um, and Matt, Matt, welcome to the Jacobin Show. Oh, thanks for having me. So I think uh, a lot of our viewers are probably familiar with you as uh, the founder and uh, president of the People's Policy Project, which you started in, I think, 2017, right? Yes. Yes. Um, 
So we we had tons of questions to ask you about some of the like white papers and policies that um, you know you've been designing. Um, however, before we get to that, I would like to briefly talk about something that is going on in the news recently um, because I think that lots of people uh, are interested to hear what you have to say about it. And it's that uh, Neera Tanden was a few months ago uh, nominated by Joe Biden uh, to head the Office of Management and Budget. Um, Neera, you know, is a prolific tweeter and that has caused her some trouble in the confirmation process where it now looks like her chances of becoming the OMB director are quickly tanking. Uh, West Virginia's Joe Manchin, uh, you know, has recently come out saying that he won't support her nomination. Um, I don't think it's likely that any Republicans will. And um, I wanted to ask you about it because you, Prior, prior to Neera Tandon even being a kind of twinkle in the OMB's eye, uh, you had had a pretty well-known run-in with her. Um, and I bring it up because it also has to do with tweets. <laughs> <laughs> you did and this before it was cool, too. That's you did right, this before yeah. it was you are, cool. You are a hipster in this regard. <laughs> <laughs> but I was just wondering, for, for people who aren't quite caught up on what happened and why you knew about Neera Tandon before anybody else, what happened? Uh, I mean, the short of it is that in the 2015 primary, we kind of mixed it up a little bit because she was for Hillary and I was for Bernie. Um, I was one of the few people in the think tank world that was for Bernie, um, at least publicly. And uh, we got into a spat at one point. Uh, the genesis of this weirdly was a piece that Joan Walsh wrote at The Nation saying that, you know, Bernie's supporters are just, you know, all white men and and how she she wants to support the candidate of women and people of color. And I'd respond to Joan, uh, well, you know, it's actually, it's really an age thing. You know, young people of color support Bernie more than Hillary. The same thing for young women, the same thing, you know, all, on and on down the line. And uh, Neera Tannen jumped into the thread at one point. So I, this is important context because I didn't come at her. She came at me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I don't remember the precise details, but the, the tweet that got me in trouble was, uh, I, I, you know, I was going on about welfare reform, welfare reform, because uh, Hillary Clinton was part of that. And so was Neera Tannen because she worked in uh, the White House under Hillary Clinton. And uh, Neera decided to defend herself by saying, well, you know, I was on welfare. So, you know, sort of like, how dare you, uh, you know, accuse me of being bad on welfare when I uh, when, when I was on it. A, a kind of a twist on the usual, like, uh, uh, well, I have an identity that uh, privileges mm -hmm. me in this respect. Except or for I welfare. have black identity. friends. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> except the identity is I received welfare <laughs> instead of like, I'm a woman or something like that. Which, um, not to out you, you also have that identity. Is that, isn't that true? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, and that was clear in the thread as well, because I was talking about my own uh, situation. Um, but uh, so I, you know, I just said, uh, you know, scumbag Nero uses welfare when she needs it and takes it away from others when when they need it, which was a reference to a scumbag Steve meme, which was a thing at the mm -hmm. time, but not not anymore. I um, recall that. And uh, it just it just went off from there. Demos fired me and put out a press release saying I was a really bad guy, and uh, then I lost my other job at the NLRB for uh, related reasons. Um, and uh, that's why I now have my own think tank, <laughs> <laughs> where you well, can I'll, call whoever you want, scumbags. Uh, yeah, no more boss. <laughs> right, you, know, you can go off on the internet. <laughs> Um, I mean, okay, so there's kind of two follow up questions then. Um, so I've seen a lot of people sort of saying like, uh, uh, you know, well, Nira, Nira totally sucks, but we, we don't want anyone to be fired because of tweets. And as somebody who was in, mm. the, in, in that situation, I wonder if you agree with that or if you're kind of just like, hey, you live by the sword, you die by the sword, because that's kind of like when it comes to her now, that's kind of my take, right? Um, but then the follow up question is, there obviously since I mean, you alluded to this when you spoke about welfare reform. There are obviously reasons to oppose Neera Tanda's nomination that go beyond tweets. So talk about that. Yeah, I mean, that's the sad thing that the, she's living and dying on uh, what she said about uh, Republican members of Congress, um, which, you know, that's not the ideal way to take her down. You know, uh, mm -hmm. it would be better to point to her record. You know, um, the most recent event was in 2010 when Obama was pitching uh, cuts to Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid as part of a grand bargain to, you know, balance the budget. Uh, she cap came out and she came out, went on TV, went on C-SPAN, you know, went, went out and was promoting this directly. And I remember in one of the uh, interviews she did, she even uh, 
excited to mention. I know some of my progressive uh, peers, they don't like that I'm, <laughs> I'm out here doing this. <laughs> um, and so, you know, with Nira, it's sort of hard to say, like, what does she believe or what does she not believe? Because um, in that case, you know, she was just carrying water for Obama. Uh, before that, she was probably just carrying water for Hillary. Um, you know, she's an operative more than anything else. But in being an operative and kind of going with the the flow of the Democratic Party over the last 25 years, that flow has been very negative in a lot of places. And so she's she's got the same negative track record as the Democratic Party more generally. Yeah. Well, uh, hopefully that little clip doesn't go viral because some Republican takes it up and says, even socialists, know, like, although they have been saying oh, she's getting a lot of hate from the left. But I think the left is more concerned with her record, like you said, and less concerned with her t Twitter profile. Yeah, I mean, I mean, as a practical matter, you know, what they're saying she's going to do at OMB is she's kind of going to be like the budget negotiator for the president, you know, in Congress. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why I actually think Joe Manchin has an interesting take on this, which is, well, she's supposed to come up here and negotiate the budget with us. And she's burned all, she's just pissed everyone off. And no, no mm -hmm. one's her, like, how's that going to work? I mean, like, that actually <laughs> kind of makes a little sense. But um, but aside from that, I don't know if I'm uh, someone who has the kind of grievances and grudges she has against the left, which are very kind of personal in nature, not mm. just, I don't know that she has super strong policy co commitments, but she's committed to the establishment of the Democratic Party. And as a result mm -hmm. of that, she has generated a lot of just just antipathy and, and, and just grudges against Bernie and all the rest of it. And so, uh, you know, when it comes to the cutting room floor on the budget, I don't think she's going to prioritize what Bernie might want to put in there, you know, as, a, I don't know, a, an extra $5 billion for community health centers or something. She might say, mm -hmm. well, we got to cut and, you know, I don't like him. And so, uh, yeah, there are totally legitimate reasons to think, well, maybe it would be, be better to get someone in there to do negotiations who doesn't just, just hate the left on a kind of visceral level. Yeah, that's very sound. Um, I wanted to ask you about another um, kind of topical policy recommendation that's come up in the past few weeks, which is Biden's inclusion of an earned income tax credit for um, families to help get with the stimulus bill. Um, and you've criticized that a lot. And I was wondering if you could take us through why you criticized uh, that kind of tax credit for providing benefits is it particular to the pandemic? Do you disagree with it on its face in general? Um, why is it such a bad idea? Yeah, so I wrote a piece in the New York Times about this a couple, maybe last week, but what I was kind of getting at is in Biden's COVID, uh, COVID proposal, the $1.9 trillion proposal that they're kicking around right now, one of the interesting things he does is he takes the child tax credit which currently is not available to most poor people because they don't earn enough money to receive it. And he makes it available to them uh, for one year um, and will pay it out monthly and all the rest of it. And I've been proposing something similar to that for, for a long time. Um, you know, I won't get into the details of why that particular policy is different. But what I thought was weird is he says, hey, it's not fair that the child tax credit, that, that we don't give the child tax credit to poor people. You know, if anything, poor kids need it the most. And it's like, that's very reasonable. But there's another tax credit that is just another child tax credit. It's basically child tax credit 2.0, but we call it the earned income tax credit. And it functions mm -hmm. exactly the same way. And so it's, you know, the piece was saying, why don't you include them as well? Like, why don't you take the earned income tax credit and do the exact same thing you're doing the child tax credit? And then the piece I, I lay out, you know, why that why it's so bad, you know, for the same, for among other things, right? If if you don't earn enough money, you don't receive the benefit. That is disproportionate mm -hmm. racial impacts. Like fifteen percent of black kids don't receive the EITC. Only five percent of white kids do. Um, and and the other point, and this is a sort of like not just a disproportional, you know, race, racial disproportionate point, but the other point is that benefits that operate like that that you can only receive if you earn an, enough money they empower bosses and people who hire and fire to not just decide whether you can receive your wages or your health insurance or whatever else they control, but they also effectively control whether you receive this benefit. You know, um, so this actually got cut in part of the edits, but I, I, I was kind of going on a, a little bit of a riff and saying like, we know that 
when people are hiring people, if they get a resume that has a black sounding name, they're uh, much less likely to call them back than if they have a white sounding name. And that's one of the reasons why the black unemployment rate is usually twice the white unemployment rate. But what we don't think about is when uh, the hiring manager looks over you because, the, because of racial bias, implicit or explicit, uh, the government then kind of kicks you in the stomach and says, well, now you also don't get the earned income tax credit because you're mm -hmm. not working. Um, and so, I don't know, I try, try to kind of connect that to saying, if, if we're now a woke democratic party and we worry about structural racism and that sort of thing, it's sort of weird to acknowledge that people are not getting hired because of their race and then also say, if you don't get hired, you don't deserve benefits because you're lazy, you know? Mm -hmm. I, want to I don't think they're that woke yet, but... <laughs> right, that's the next phase. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I want to quickly add another point about the EITC, which I can't remember if you've talked about this before as well, um, but because the EITC is a benefit that's kind of submerged in the tax system, people don't really understand it as a benefit, right? Mm -hmm. So people, so it's kind of the opposite of like Trump sending out a check with his face stamped on it. Like it's like a government program that no one thinks of a government, no one thinks is yep. a government program because it's so hidden within taxes that people are just like, oh, this is my money. Like I got my money back. Um, yeah. Can I add to that, Jen? Because there's a book called um, It's Not Like I'm Poor, How Working Class Families Make Ends Meet in the Post-Welfare World. Great book. Highly recommend it. Um, the authors talk about how the earned income tax credit has a special status with people who see themselves as like the worthy poor, right? It's not a handout. It's more like a, a reward. It's a benefit for being a worker and a taxpayer. And for them, personally, it doesn't have the same stigma as other types of welfare benefits. But then the authors go on to show that it's really not a social safety net program for all of the reasons that you outlined, Matt. Um, and that it do does very little in the long term to help these families, but it enjoys popular support because it seems like a, a little... Uh, like a, <laughs> a reward for being a taxpayer in a certain income bracket. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I mean, the EITC, the way it's designed is is really negative, uh, aside from the, the sort of racial points and like the hypocrisy points. Uh, among other things, 22% um, of people who are eligible for it don't actually receive it because it's complicated. They don't know. Because uh, mm -hmm. these are people, because you can receive it even if you don't have tax liability. So there's a kind of conceptual mm. confusion that people run into where they go, well, I don't owe tax, so I'm not going to file tax, which mm -hmm. you're allowed to mm -hmm. do. If you don't owe it, you don't have to file it. But you have to say, well, no, no, you want to file it because there's this benefit you get, even though you didn't pay any tax. And like, obviously, I mean, you're already too far gone for a lot of people mm -hmm. to understand. You can get a Wait, I'm getting a tax refund for taxes I didn't pay. And it's like, yeah, I, yeah, that's how it works. <laughs> um, and so there's that problem. Uh, and then, and I know that book you're talking about, Catherine Eden, and, and I, I've had some run-ins with her over the years about this because- uh -oh. <laughs> More internet kind of, strife. <laughs> she, she ends up kind of being a bit of a partisan for the EITC because she says essentially that, hey, it is a benefit that a lot of poor people get, not the very poorest because they're excluded, um, but you know, people who are kind of right around the poverty line are eligible for it. and they don't feel bad about it in the way that people mm -hmm. feel bad about getting food stamps or Medicaid and whatever. And so she kind of sees that as a plus. And I try to push mm -hmm. back and say, the only reason they feel bad about receiving those other programs is because they're so targeted. Mm -hmm. And so if, if we had <laughs> made this program available to everyone, such as through a universal child benefit, then they're not going to feel bad about it either. Like people don't feel bad about getting the social security check. They don't feel bad yeah. about getting their Medicare. They feel bad about getting these really heavily means tested programs because they're stigmatized. And so mm -hmm. I, I feel like she she doesn't go far enough in, in reasoning through like, well, wait a minute. Why am I trying to overcome the stigma? And is this the only way to do it? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, so I so actually was going to ask oh. you about that. <laughs> but you already answered it. So go ahead, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was just going to follow up on that by asking you to talk a little bit about um, the People's Policy Project's Family Fun Pack, um, because this, I think, is kind of an example of a comprehensive way to not just get at child poverty, um, but to also help parents kind of across the income spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and Talk a little bit about what goes into the family fun pack um, and why, actually, specifically why you call it a fun pack, because that's the opposite of like 
tax credit, like dreary tax credit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was a very, uh, that, that's been my uh, the biggest hit of anything we've put out so far, uh, in part because the name is probably fun. Um, but I put that out ahead of the election, hoping I could convince some people to adopt parts of it. And I did. I actually got Bernie adopted a few of the benefits and even uh, Gillibrand actually adopted one of them. Uh, talked mm. to her staff about it. Um, I missed hers. I had yeah, well, she was, in, she was in and out in about two weeks on <laughs> right. the campaign. So <laughs> didn't help her win unfortunately um well you know fortunately or not but um what i wanted to do with that paper was i wanted to kind of make a full-throated here's the social democratic case for these benefits i don't want to talk about well some kids are poor and they need benefits it's like okay sure but like what's going on why are there so many poor kids like what's the deal um and the answer i give in the paper is i say that there are if you look at the structure of the economy right you have basically two problems that appear with kids the first one is that kids need resources, but they obviously they can't make any income, right? That seems very obvious, but like <laughs> people don't think about that, I guess, because we're so used to thinking, well, there's sort of the parents' responsibility and their parent makes income. It's like, yeah, yeah, that's all well and true, but uh, you know, a, a parent that has like four kids is very different from a parent who has zero kids, even if they're otherwise identical. And the state, I just think, the, I just yeah. think kids should still be working in factories. I'm just kidding. <laughs> when, when did we become a country of handouts? There actually was a politician, I forgot who it was, but he was um, praising a boy who worked as a janitor in his school to earn down his school lunch debt. I don't yeah. know if you remember Newt that. Gingr Newt Gingrich in the, it was advocating the in the 90s, having uh, kids, poor kids do just the janitorial work. <laughs> So, you're but, but anyway, that. so there's that. So there's that aspect of it, right? It's just and to say, I don't know, in a sense, kind of think like kids are like little disabled people, <laughs> or they're little retired people, and they need benefits, just like disabled and retired people receive benefits in order to kind of make this all shake out. And then the second point was that when you look at, uh, you know, fertility, when what is the window of fertility? You know, it's roughly like, uh, you know, I don't know, what 16 to 40 or whatever. And well, that's not high earning periods, right? Like your high earning periods come in your late 40s and your early 50s. And so people have kids when they're at the lowest level of earnings and the kids also don't bring in any income. And there's your problem. That's why you get so much poverty and inequality when you're dealing with families with kids. And I thought like make that full throated argument instead of just talking about helping poor kids. And then you can see why the universal family benefits that exist in other countries make so much sense. Because every family who adds a kid deals with financial stress because they now have to spend, you know, thousands and thousands of extra dollars, but they don't get any money in. Um, and so from there, I'd say, okay, well, what should the benefits be? And frankly, I just kind of copied the benefits from Northern European countries. So we get when you have a, a kid at birth, they give you a baby box, you know, with like, uh, uh, whatever, uh, like, uh, clothes and pacifiers and bottles and whatever. And that's fun. Um, and then you get paid leave, of course, then you get free childcare or heavily subsidized childcare in the paper. I say, just make it free. Uh, you get free school lunches, free health care for all kids, right? You could do Medicare for kids as a kind of stepping stone to Medicare for all if we can't like get it all done. Um, and you get a child allowance, a check every month for the kid, just like a, a disabled person receives a benefit or an elderly person receives a benefit. And, you know, you go on down the line and you just kind of copy those benefits. And once you do that, you know, child poverty is going to shrink to, you know, 4 four percent, 3 4%. Percent. Uh, you know, that pretty much handles that. But more than that, it helps everyone who deals with this thing, right? Because even if you're making six figures, you have a kid, daycare costs 20 grand, that's not an easy thing to deal with. But mm -hmm. if you could spread the cost of daycare out across all of society, then it becomes a lot cheaper. And you don't, and more importantly, you don't get punched in the face when you have a kid, you know, it's spread out across your whole life. You're paying the tax, you know, every year. Yeah, I think one of the figures for the cost of, you know, raising a kid is like $250,000 um over the course of their life that's a lot of money um typically people are told well don't do it or <laughs> um people delay having kids there's a lot of uh women who wait to have kids until they're much older which comes with an increased health burden not that they have um, difficult pregnancies necessarily but they are screened much more heavily um they have um a litany of tests that they have to go through i think it's called a geriatric pregnancy 
they're over 35. Um, wow, that's all it takes for geriatric these days. <laughs> <laughs> for a woman. Yeah, okay? right, right. A man is geriatric <laughs> at 95. <Right. laughs> um, yeah, it's really shifted how Americans have decided to have kids. And you see this over and over again with people putting it off um, when they don't want to. Some people say this is a good thing. It's good for climate change. I disagree. I don't want to live in a world where first or developed nations and rich countries have people who choose to not have kids to save the climate and then every other country where you can't make that choice has to ship in their care labor to take care of us when right well right that's the key is like uh you know i mean you can talk about what's the appropriate level of population i suppose but uh, we're all going to be too old to work one day, and the only way that works on a society level is if you have some people who are who are not too old to work. And so, yeah. it's it's part of us. It's part of living in a society. You can't, you know, you, you go to extinction, and and even before you go to extinction, things start collapsing very quickly if you don't have uh, workers. Right? I mean, we know yeah. that as a socialist, that's sort of our whole thing, right? <laughs> yeah, that is our whole thing. And you see this in other countries that are struggling with declining birth rates that are putting in place um, measures to try to encourage that. Sometimes it's giving people paid leave to have sex, which I think is happening in Japan. Um, other times, which, you know, that's fine. That's a demand we can add. <laughs> Um, and other times it's a, exactly the policies that you've outlined that have worked so well in other countries. I like to tell people that I have kids because I'm not a free rider. <laughs> I'm paying into the Yeah, you're just the reproducing the thought. workforce. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I want to switch gears slightly um, and talk about something else that the People's Policy Project has been working on, which I find really interesting, which is um, looking at the racial wealth gap and specifically, um, specifically, specifically, I guess, challenging or um, uh, engaging with the ways that people think about the racial wealth gap and what we should do about it. So the racial wealth gap is like super hot right now, by which I mean, you know, everybody's concerned about it from people on the left all the way to Bloomberg philanthropies. Um, and so... And it's kind of just taken as this given that, you know, this is this is sort of the um, best example of the ongoing disparities between black and white America. Right. Because the median household of like white families last year was something in the like hundreds of thousands of dollars, whereas the median income of black families in the U.S. Uh, last year was like 20,000. So there's this huge and vast disparity. Um, but you have recently looked at that and you've come to a slightly different conclusion or you you have an interpretation of how we should be thinking about that. Um, what is that? Yeah, actually, uh, I actually came to this conclusion in late 2017 because that's when the think tank started. And one of the things I wanted to do was let's do a reparations paper because, you know, none of the other think tanks are going to do that. Uh, and I started, you know, crunching the numbers and like figuring out, you know, just kind of basic level. Let's go into the wealth survey, see what we can do to like make this work. Um, and then I figured out like pretty quickly when trying to figure out what, you know, how to do this policy that, well, you know, actually all the wealth is held by pretty much like the top 10%. The top 10% of white people own 75% of white wealth. The bottom third own nothing. And then, and then you, and you say, okay, well, that's very interesting. On one level, this will, that's going to make this a lot easier <laughs> because you just got, you know, there's only 10% of them. You just take their wealth, spread it out, you're good to go. And then you go and you switch to the, to black wealth and it's like, it's the same thing, mm -hmm. <laughs> 75%. And then I start doing all sorts of other cuts. What about Latino wealth? What about college educated wealth? What and you see the same thing over and over again. The top 10% owns that 75% uh, of the wealth of that group. Now the group still have different amounts, right? So, you know, black wealth is just less of it than white wealth. Um, so being, you know, owning 75% of less wealth is still less, right? The gap is still mm -hmm. there, but the distributions are so weird and the way that we would normally think about it, that it's sort of hard to think about how exactly would, the, would we fix this? Because you could think about two basic ways of doing it, right? One would be to say, well, we're just going to grab, you know, however much white wealth we need, you know, and then, and then just pay it out equally to black wealth and, you know, to bring the things together. And then you say, okay, well, but if you do that, there will still basically be no black people in the top 10% of society or the top 5% of society uh, because 
the top 10%, of, you know, they're not receiving very much of this benefit, right? Like, so because of the way it's distributed. And and then also on the flip side, like the, the, <laughs> the I don't know, the, the poorest black person would be wealthier than like 75% of white people <laughs> at that point, because like, you know, that's how much wealth, like that's how, that's how big the gap is. And I don't know, that just seems strange. I don't know, like, is it the case that, you know, but for slavery and Jim Crow, that uh, there would be no black people in the bottom two thirds of society like that, that. Like something's gone off here. Um, and then the flip side is you would say, well, we could base it. We could kind of scale the payments to the wealth of each group. Right. So we would we would just bring the bottom 10 percent of black people up to the bottom 10 percent of white people and the middle, fifth, you know, the middle 10 percent of white people up to the middle 10 percent of black people or vice versa. And. But then if you do that, you're paying 75% of the pay of the reparation payments are going to the wealthiest uh, 10% of black people. And then like the poorest 10% of black people aren't receiving much of anything. And so you kind of cut in this double bind, right? Mm -hmm. Either you pay the reparations out to everyone and then, you know, like, like I said before, the poorest black person is wealthier than the bottom two thirds of white people and you still don't have any really rich black people. Um, or you pay it out in this graduated way, and almost all the wealth is going to the wealthiest black people. And it's like, I don't know how to, I, that doesn't seem to be a way through that. Um, so that yeah. I kind of gave up on it at that point. Well, so I want to I want to follow up quickly because I think that um, two of the scholars who work a lot on the racial wealth gap, and I think actually both advised the Bernie Sanders campaign, uh, that's Sandy Darity and Derek Hamilton. One of their big proposals is something they call baby bonds. So mm. that's that's you know for anybody who's not familiar with that, that is basically a government run or like a public trust fund that everybody who's born in the U.S., regardless of their race, so this is not just for black people, um, but everybody, every child that's born basically gets a trust fund from the government that they can access when they're like 18 or 21 or whatever. Um, and, you know, they can use that money to further their education. They can use the money to put a down payment on a home um, or, you know, start a business or whatever. And this idea that um, I think Hamilton and Darity sort of put forward is that this is something that can help close the racial wealth gap. It's universal, but it's also race conscious. Um, do you have any thoughts on that proposal? Yeah, yeah. I mean, one thing I think, uh, I think they, they're very clever in the way that they describe it. If you actually look at the proposal, it's a proposal to give 18 year olds like a big check, which is not a bad idea, but it, <laughs> they're very smart in being like, it's for little babies, you know, because people are maybe, <laughs> they're, not the as, <laughs> they're not as keen on the idea of just, uh, but like, you don't get it till you're 18. It's like, it's a sort of a fictional account in the government until that point. Uh, so that's, that is one problem though, because the way that they have it set up, people won't start getting benefits until 2039 and like, like, I don't know, like, is they going to survive 18 years uh, before anyone gets a single dollar from it? Probably not. Um, but if you put that aside, um, you know, it's a fine program, I guess. I think it's, a, I think some of the restrictions that they put on how you spend it are a little bit weird. Like, well, you can use it on a down payment. Like they're trying to basically make you put it into assets because they don't want mm -hmm. you to, to spend it because then it doesn't close the wealth gap, right? If you spend it on consumption. But as anyone knows, if you buy an asset, you can then sell it, right? So like, it's sort yeah. of an, you know, well, okay, I, I can only buy, I can only put a down payment on a house. All right, I'll go put a down payment on a house and then I'll go resell the house. Now I have the cash. Like there are parts of it that are a little bit strange in that regard. Um, but the other, the biggest thing is just that they're pitching this as closing the racial wealth gap. And what they're really talking about is closing the difference between like the 50th percentile uh, white family and the 50th percentile black family. And it, it doesn't even really do that, um, but it does bring those two families closer together. But the important point is here is that the 50th percentile, like the middle of the white wealth distribution owns almost no white wealth. Like the middle fifth of the white wealth distribution owns less than 3% of white wealth. And the same thing for the middle fifth of the black uh, wealth distribution. Mm -hmm. So you're evening out or starting to even out the gap between two groups of people that really don't own much of anything, like yep. of, the, of the overall pie. And it works because fi people love to fixate on medians, medians, medians. They don't like mm -hmm. to look at the whole distribution. And so you can kind of snow people a little bit, but like it's not, that is not reparations as far as I'm concerned. Like you're going to have to up the, up the number, like, a uh, hundredfold, a thousandfold, maybe to even get close, you know. 
I wanted to ask one one last question before we let you go. Um, one of the other policies that you've suggested is to create a social wealth fund that would pay out yearly to people. Um, I wanted to ask what effects this would have, and you know why you what you envision this policy doing, and also how that's different than at like a UBI program. Yeah, so you know, as socialists, one of the questions you have to ask yourself is, you know, we, we're not keen on the idea that having uh, ten percent of people own seventy-five percent of the wealth and this sort of small group of people who own all the assets, and not only own the assets and kind of have control over them, but also receive a lot of income from owning the assets. About one in three dollars of income in the country is paid out to people who simply own things like real estate and stock and bonds and that sort of thing. And so one answer to that question, which I'm kind of keen on, and which, uh, you know, there's a sort of, it was a big thing in Sweden in the 70s, was to say, well, why don't we just, since most of the assets are these tradable assets like real estate and stocks and bonds, and we know how to create funds that own these things, like kind of separate from individuals, why don't we create just one big fund, have it buy up everything, give every person one share of ownership in it, and then pay out dividends to everyone. And so in that way, we can capture uh, this uh, one in three dollars that currently mm -hmm. is being paid to essentially the top 10%. We can capture these one in three dollars and spread it out to everyone. Um, and that's the basic gist of it. And Alaska actually has a program that works exactly like this called the Alaska mm -hmm. Permanent Fund. Um, they pay out checks about, depends on the year, but it could be as much as two, three thousand dollars a year per person. So for a family of four, that's uh, what that's eight to twelve thousand uh, dollars that you get in a nice little check, and it comes directly from just stuff they own, you know, mm -hmm. dividends on Apple stock and stuff like <laughs> that. Um, and that's like that's not the end state, obviously. Then once you own it, you want to start maybe making changes to the way the com companies operate and that kind of thing. But that's the basic idea: is using finance and these sort of fund mechanisms to socialize the ownership of of capital. Mm -hmm. We had like 50,000 more questions to ask you about the yeah. PBA and nationalizing <laughs> fossil fuels. And we didn't even get to that. We didn't even talk about how you're from Texas. Um, but we'll save that for a future episode since um, I think you have to go now. Um, but Matt, thank you so much for coming on the show, uh, dishing the dirt on Nira, and <laughs> more importantly, talking about uh, some of the policies that um, People's Policy Project is working on these days. All right. Thanks for having me. And I'd be happy to come back, talk about those things. That's Great. Yeah. Be continued. Right. We'll save Bye. those questions. <laughs> That was fun. It was nice. It's also a great follow up to the kind of grim uh, segments that we had because there are solutions at hand. Mm -hmm. And we see the counterfactual in you know, pretty much every other developed nation in the world mm -hmm. um, about <laughs> how we can create systems that actually work for people. And um, what I liked about some of these policies that were mentioned is that they there are risk sharing policies mm -hmm, exactly that um, can change how people evaluate their futures and make decisions. Kale, can we run a clip that I forgot to use <laughs> at the top of the show by Jacob Hacker talking about the way that a lot of welfare um, programs are criticized and what they can actually do? When critics of programs of economic security talk about security, they think of it as like a hammock, as uh, Congressman Paul Ryan said, the comfortable hammock that, that encourages people not to work. But in fact, all the research suggests the opposite, that without some basic security, people don't feel comfortable investing in their futures. They don't have the capacity to look beyond the day-to-day -day anxieties to be able to build strong families and strong communities and to look to the future in a way that allows them to plan and innovate and create. And we need a new social contract for the 21st century. We have a more global economy. There is more technological pressure to automate jobs. But we can't leave people to sink or swim on their own, because they can't. And the only way we're going to reclaim the ideal of economic security that's so central to the American dream is to actually find ways to pool risks outside of the workplace. So I know Matt would have very different proposals than Jacob Hacker would. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I actually, I, I can't say for sure about Jacob Hacker, but I feel like he might have advised Bernie too. 
Don't quote me on that, but he was kind of he's he's pointed to as the architect of like America's single payer plan. Oh, okay. That transition, um, and particularly advocating for that to be part of the ACA, which we know it was stricken from. But he thinks, you know, we need this incremental shift towards a single payer system that, you know, potentially leads to Medicare for all. Um, but he really focuses on um, having having a public option, right, mm-hmm. as a first mm-hmm. step. And mm-hmm. I think Warren's plan was closest to his plan. Oh, okay. Um, and then, uh, and he also advised, you know, Obama on the ACA and, and that okay. failed to, to make the gains that I think he would have wanted, particularly because it doesn't have a single payer option. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's not driving down the cost of healthcare, right? It doesn't create competition, with a huge pool of people being insured by one program that can drive healthcare costs down and then p- potentially drive them down for other private insurers. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the key parts of this. But um, having Medicare for all would render that <laughs> right, <laughs> right, question right. of competition completely irrelevant. Right, right. Yeah, um, I should have said this while we still had Matt on, but I'm just really glad that People's Policy Project exists. Um, he had mentioned that you know he he did some sort of um, unofficial advising for the Bernie campaign, uh, mm-hmm. which is which is how that campaign kind of came to some of their child uh, benefits proposals. Um, and you know they're like the People's Policy Project is completely independently funded, which is not the case uh, with obviously most think tanks. Um, I mean, they're not beholden to any foundation, which is something you and I have criticized on the show before. Um, So I like I can't wait to see what they, you know, do in the future. And when I say they like like I think it might just be Matt. I should have asked him about that before. But I mean, if it is, that's only all the more impressive, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you can see how some of these policies would directly affect some of the people that we showed in our clips. Yeah. You know, I think people can apply this to their own life. But um when you're looking at a person who lost their job because their medical benefits were cut and you think about what their life would be like if they just could rely on health benefits. Mm -hmm. That man could have kept working at that poultry plant. He might have seen increases in his well-being because his health could improve by having regular care. Mm -hmm. There are so many things um, that that could create a foundation for. And that's mm-hmm. true with so many different Americans. Mm-hmm. Um, I wish that we had time to get into the housing pr- uh, policies that they have too, but we're just going to have to do a follow-up show. I think we say this at every show too. We're like, this <laughs> right, is right. show. Yeah, season <laughs> two, the same people will be back on to elaborate on what we missed last time. <laughs> um, but I think yeah, I mean, I think on that note, you know, um, we will have Matt Brunig back on in the future. Um, this this topic is certainly not closed. Um, so please stay tuned. Yeah. And uh, we'll see this, I'm sure, play out in even more cute, well-defined ways as the coronavirus, c- coronavirus crisis wears on. Yeah. Um, and I think another important thing to think through is how could some of these policies change people's lives during a crisis like this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, stay safe, everybody. Um, Thanks for watching and we will see you next time. Have a good night. Good night, guys. 